Welcome, welcome very much to Conversations. We're pleased to welcome to the program uh, Dr. Stanley or Dr. Stanley Aronowitz. He's of course with the CUNY uh, City University of New York. And we're talking with him tonight. We've talked with him in the past, and uh, he's somebody certainly to be listened to on many, many uh, issues. But particularly, we're talking tonight to highlight a book that he's written relatively recently, which we want to show right at the outset. And maybe if we could come in, in on that book. It's called The Jobless Future, and it's uh, subtitled SciTech and the Dogma of Work. Right, an extremely interesting and important and relevant work, uh, if I may say so, and talks about that, along with um, other people who are beginning to address this unpopular theme. But it's an extremely important book, and I'm really very pleased to welcome uh, uh, Stanley to the, uh, to the program, and welcome Stanley to Conversations. Thank you. And to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. <laughs> Now you you uh, you you you're with the study, if I may, at CUNY uh, with the with the Center of Cultural Studies. Are you I'm the director of the Center for Cultural Studies at CUNY Graduate School. All right, and you have a wide purview. You're a bit of a comprehensive. You have a lot of things that you're very interested in, more so than I think many scholars are in terms of being specialized in one field. You have a pretty wide purview that intellectually you try and keep an assistant's way attention to, if I'm not that's, mistaken. That's correct. Yes. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your own background, if you could. Well, I I. Um, I was born and raised in the Bronx, right. went to public schools, and attended music and art high school, uh -huh. and then tried to go to Brooklyn College at a very bad time in the uh, post-Second World War history. It was a time of McCarthyism, and it was a time of, uh, of, uh, of a lot of repression, and I got uh, pretty sick of college. Yeah. And I dropped out of college and went to work in uh, steel industry and I worked in uh, metal industries for about 10 years. Picking up some real life experience. Well, it wasn't just life experience. I was supporting a family. I got married at the age of 19, right. moved to New Jersey, and working in these plants, I became active in the union and became a member of the grievance committee of my local union in a steel mill in Harrison, New Jersey. And then um, around 1960, the, um, the recession and um, the decline of that particular mill that I was part of, I decided to do full-time union work. And I worked for the um, Amalgamated Clothing Workers and then the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. And in 1970, uh, after um, spending a lot of time in the, as a union organizer, I took a job founding an alternative public high school okay. in uh, East Harlem in Yorkville called Park East High School. And in 1972, uh, went into um, Staten Island Community College, where I started a program called the Community Studies Program. Meanwhile, I picked up a BA, right, and in 1975 got my PhD in well in sociology. In sociology, which again, uh, yeah, which a was a very field. wide, wide right, field right, right. because I had many interests. My interest in education, my background in culture, in labor, in uh, and then I got interested later on in science and technology. Right. My first book, False Promises, The Shaping of American Working Class Consciousness, was to a large extent a reflection of my own experiences in the labor movement mm -hmm. and working in the plant. Right. And um, after that, I wrote books on, uh, on politics. I've written books, two books on education. Right. I've written uh, a book on science and technology. I've written uh, three books on culture. I've written um, a variety of uh, two, three hundred articles, published articles. So I've, I've been writing. Yeah, you, you, co you, as they say, I think you, you do in a real sense cover the waterfront in a certain sense, which is, uh, which is right to be commended for that. Because if anything, it seems to me we need are people who can, in a sort of, I don't know, it's an overworked term, but in a systems way, begin to understand the relationships between various aspects of what's going on in yeah, our society. The problem I really think that is needed. The problem know? with specialization, Harold, is that. It doesn't allow you to see the system. And my concern has always been the system mm -hmm. and the conditions for social change. Mm. And I've become convinced that uh, you really can't study narrowly. Studying narrowly is basically an academic professional activity. My activity is really intellectual and political. And I'm trying to figure out for not only myself, but for wh whoever would read or listen to me, mm -hmm. uh, what are our problems and what can we start doing about them? I don't mean to put a fine point on this, but you know, when you say that this is an academic thing, isn't it possible that given the fact that we've invested so much of our energy and thought and so forth in terms of intellectual activity in the academic process, that there ought be a place within the structure 
formally or otherwise, or formally perhaps, for comprehensive overview, for comprehensive approaches rather than specialization, and that all of education's activity shouldn't be concert, concentrated only within specialized Patterns. That's, why I started, that's why I started the Center for Cultural Studies. Okay. The right. center has done a, a conference uh, every year uh -huh. and many uh, colloquia. It's done a lot of talks by various people. The last two conferences, the first one was on techno science and cyberspace. Right. That was our, that's going to be a book with Routledge uh -huh. coming out almost as we speak. Uh -huh. And the second uh, conference was called The Wages of Cybernation. Uh -huh. and we brought people from all kinds of uh, backgrounds. And, and try to figure out what about this uh, relationship between technological change and jobs. Okay, I'm commending you for your efforts in that and saying in a certain sense that you oughtn't, if you do, to the degree that one does in order to establish those kind of, you know, comprehensive or overview uh, areas of discipline, that you had to fight a fight against specialization. I'm commending you what you did and just suggesting in a generic sense that the education process, which is becoming very important, ought to have more and more of a role for what Booker, Mr. Fuller said, a comprehensive overview of things. There should be more. Just a general that's, point. That's right. The you problem know, we're having. Can you see things that way differently than if you're all specialized in a particular field? The problem we're having at City University, and I entirely yeah. agree with you, is that with the budget cuts and the fights that are taking place to uh, to save the institution from being basically reduced, is that there doesn't seem to be any political will and any, any educational vision able to start new programs that would embody those principles. Right. I have worked with group in um, the Graduate Center to start a, uh, uh, an interdisciplinary intercultural program. Good. Whether that program will ever see the light of day depends entirely upon the gods. Well, may it prosper and flourish, if I may, and may all of your others who get that way do. I just wanted to make that point. And you've been looking at, the, in that, the, the, you know, looking at things in that way. We want to talk about this question because it is, I said in the introduction with your book, The Jobless Future, and uh, that, that is an unpopular subject among academia and among business and other leaders because it is positing in a certain sense difficulties that the society is facing that people comfortable in the old paradigms and ways of thinking and so forth are not comfortable facing. Is, the, is that, do you it, think it, that's the case? It is but true. Maybe you could lay out, maybe we could talk about the book a little bit here, okay. uh, The Jobless Future. It came to, what, what, what's your major themes and that sort of well, thing? Well, our major theme in the book is a, uh, is a fairly simple idea which, um, as you have said, is unpopular. And that idea is that technological change and the pressure on wages to be lower and lower, part-time jobs and contingent jobs to increase profitability are creating a situation where productivity of workers is outpacing economic growth. And that because of this and because we can never grow as much as the productivity because of computer mediated work is, is, is creating, that we have to look forward to fewer and fewer good jobs being created, not simply uh, 25 or 50 years from now, but next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. And that in order to be able to um, deal with this question, we, can't, we can do two things or three things that really would be uh, very uh, much part, not the whole solution, but uh -huh. part of the solution. Uh -huh. The first thing we can do is shorten the work week. Okay, right. Uh -huh. And begin to place limitations on the amount of overtime people can work. Uh, people may think, well, that is uh, interfering with market forces. The answer is yes, it would interfere with market forces, but it's necessary because we have a situation now where some people are working 60 hours a week and other people are unemployed. Yeah. We have a world unemployment and underemployment rate of 882 million Read people. that figure, it's unbelievable. Well, it's 30% I mean, of the labor force. The, the, these problems are on a world scale. That's correct. Are they worse on a world scale than they are as we confront them in the industrialized world or not? Uh, yes. Or in, different? It, well, they're different in every country. Yeah. Um, in places like India, uh, the unemployment rate is probably 50%, and that's a country of 900 million people. Uh -huh. In parts of Africa, it probably is 75 or 80%. In it, Puerto it's Rico, a, it's amazing. Only 35%, Puerto Rico, which is a part of the United States, only 35% of the adults work. 
uh-huh, as uh-huh. compared to the United States where par- labor participation is about 70 or 75 percent. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Not, not all 25 percent, of course, are unemployed in this country. Uh, some, some people are housewives or ha- house husbands, actually, yeah. increasingly. Uh-huh. Uh, some people work only part-time and some people only work part of the year. Uh-huh. Um, but we have a real rate of unemployment of about 10 to 12 percent, even though our system of the Bureau of Labor Statistics says it's only around 6 percent. Have those figures, if I may, it's interesting, have those figures, the, in, the, you know, the, the difference between the reality and what the figures reflect, been the case throughout a long period of time, or have they changed the record-keeping in a recent time to, to make that different? When, well, they, when they said 8 percent uh, 20 years ago, was it still a bit higher than it was? Yes, in, it was still yeah. higher. Let me explain that unemployment statistic. It's a very tricky business. Right. First-time job seekers are not counted as unemployed. Okay. If you get out of high school or you are a uh, house ma- homemaker who decides to go to work and can't find a job until you get your first job, right. you're not among the unemployed. Uh-huh. Um, secondly, that's been consistently that's the been case. consistently that's been the case. Consistency yes, of the that's rate. right. Discouraged workers are not counted part of the unemployed. That's the other end of it. That is, if you were in the labor market, in the labor force, and you were laid off or otherwise unemployed, and you could not find a job uh, after you perhaps had unemployment compensation, uh, and you couldn't find a job and decided to stay home because you were 55, Uh because you were a woman and decided to to be a homemaker for a while, you're not counted as unemployed. You may want to go to work. Uh You may need to go to work Uh to keep the family income going. But you're not counted as un- unemployed unless you're actively seeking work. And if there are no jobs, many people get discouraged and decide they can't get work, so right. they don't seek it. They're not counted. The third group that's, uh, that's in- counted as employed are, since the volunteer army came into existence under Nixon in 1974, is the, um, uh, the army. The armed yeah, forces yeah, okay. are considered part of the employed group in the population. Oh, I see, right. Um, Then the uh, fourth group, the fourth kind of unemployment, which is not counted, but which is counted in European countries, is the part-time and the seasonal worker who works sometime during the week or year. They are counted as employed in America. In America. In in, in Europe, they are counted as partially employed, and the unemployment is calculated on the basis of the average weekly that could, re- that, that could really make a considerable dent. I mean, I don't know what the unemployment figures in Europe are. They're up close to 10 percent. 12 percent in France. France was 12, yeah. 12 percent in France. Were, and it was a big public issue. They were saying 6 percent, but in reality it's probably higher than that. Is what you're it's probably saying. close to 10 percent. Close right. up to what European standards are, That's even correct. though what yeah. we've done these things. Now, I wonder if we could, I mean, theoretically these questions are, and I want to go back, if we could, a little bit, and say, you can go back. We can look at uh, you know. We can look at Keynes, and we can look at uh, we can look at Smith. We can look at Ricardo. We can look at all the economic theories. Uh, Schumpeter. We got all these people, economic theories that come along. Lord Keynes and all of the others, Marx and all of the others that have come along to try and understand this. And one of the things they've said. Uh, let me just go through a little scenario for you. Say is this is the technocrats. This is the luddite talk. This is the same thing that we've been hearing for so long that their technology is going to displace people. And that as the cotton picking machines displaced people in the South, you have a great chapter on the implications for the black community, incidentally, but as they displaced them, they found opportunities in Mr. Ford's factory. Now, as Mr. Ford's factory and got better and better wages and even came into the middle class and so forth and that, and now as Mr. Ford's factory begins, or the industrial process begins to Um, you know, perhaps not offer the opportunities that it has or they're overseas or whatever, there's a whole new area opening up the knowledge workers, cyberspace, uh, all of the service workers are opening up and that there will be many more job opportunities opening up that the industrial process is closing down just as agricultural workers were no longer able to work in the fields, they went in the factory. Now they're going to go into all these many new opportunities for jobs and for, you know, distribution of income to jobs, high paid, high skill, high wage paid uh, jobs that are going to be open to the society. Robert Reich standing next to President Clinton will say this. Um, Newt Gingrich standing next to Newt Gingrich Alvin, will say this. Alvin Toffler. Standing next to Alvin Toffler. Well, Toffler does not say he, there are others besides Gingrich that listen to Toffler, and Toffler is a futurist. He's got some other people. But anyway, 
Gingrich standing next to Gingrich will say this, but both of them, or the people in the major parties and the major thing, will say that there's going to be opportunities, these naysayers who say that the technology is going to displace people, we've heard it all before, and we'll have a virtuous circle of growth and everything's going to be okay. That's what they're trying to say to us politically. Critique that or discuss that or I'd address be, it. I'd be happy to. The problem at this point is that the nature of the technology that is developing in the world is qualitatively different than the nature of the problems we faced in the past. All right. In the first place, computer-mediated work has one real purpose, and that's to eliminate labor. It is to reduce the amount of labor required for production. That has not been the case with the Industrial Revolution has from been, the beginning Yes, or it's not. been the case. Yeah, okay. But it is now throughout all sectors of the economy. It used to be the case, for example, that they would put intensive uh, technological changes in the factories. Yeah. People would leave the factories and get jobs in the service economy right. because the service economy was largely labor intensive. Right, okay. All right, then they put in, uh, President uh, Bush came into a uh, supermarket in 92 while, uh, while the campaign. Couldn't work the scanner. He couldn't work the scanner. Funny, huh? The scanner yeah. means that this uh, uh, clerk doesn't have to do much work uh, uh, calculating uh, the prices of the goods that, that are passing through right. over him. So there are fewer clerks required because you have the scanner. You have inventory control in warehouses that have eliminated practically everybody in this major service occupation, which is the warehouse industry. Right. But see, in our book, what we did is yeah. we, said to, we said, look, um, what Harold's analysis, or repeating of the analysis of the, uh, of the optimists, yeah. we better go look at professionals. Let's not look at industrial workers, because other people have done that work, and they've proven that the job situation there is that fewer and fewer people are producing more and more goods, manufacturing more and more goods. So we went to engineers, we went to academic teachers, and we went to medical researchers, and we discovered, lo and behold, that in engineering, computer-aided design had virtually eliminated the whole layer of engineering called drafting. Uh -huh. So there were no more drafters yeah. needed because... CAD CAM and things, yeah. CAD, CAD yeah. CAM. Yeah. And that the coordination, the communication between the design and the manufacturing process means that a whole middle layer of managers can be um, eliminated. In ways that previously they weren't that's, able to that's, be. That's, that's okay, correct. Important, yeah. And that uh, the engineer who designs can design a thousand percent more uh, uh, than they did under the old non-technology, because they were hand people. Yeah. So their, their productivity is increasing 1,000%. Now, if you take the designing process itself, it would mean that if we were going to hold on to the same number of engineers as we had before, mm -hmm. that the amount of work that they did, the actual economic goods that they produced, would have to increase by as much as 1,000%, uh, because that's what the technology has made them more productive. Mm -hmm. The the that's taking a productivity analysis. That's correct. And the right. chances are they're not going to do that. So where will the engineers go? Mm -hmm. The engineers are all the people working on these most advanced machines. These are the knowledge workers that Robert Reich mm -hmm. and others talk about. Mm -hmm. And we're now seeing the close down of engineering school. Pratt in Brooklyn closed down its engineering school. Uh, library schools, which have been used to uh, very labor-intensive kind of activity now are completely online. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the library school at Columbia University mm -hmm, shut down. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been able to open it up anyplace else. It's uh -huh. a top library school. So you're trying, you do posit in a certain, this is a qualitative new, there's something new about that's, this condition that's right. that was not relative to the historical development and uh, uh, economics thinking. We think it's a real break, yes. Uh -huh, okay, and we have that thing. And if we were to look at the development of um, of productivity analysis, and that uh, as those workers, uh, up until 1973, productivity, measuring labor input to uh, against total production in the economy, if we had measured that, productivity went up, wages more or less tracked like that. They That's went right. up with them. But since 73 or so, as I understand, there has been almost a real increase in wages. But the productivity, as we can measure it, uh, can go up. 
but that the wages either have, have leveled off or, or are beginning even to come down against uh, the, all the pressures that are being exerted on them with the downsizing and with all of the pressures right. in the private and now particularly in the governmental sector as well. We said there, we said there, are, there are three other trends besides the productivity that's increased by means of computer-aided uh, 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 processes uh, or technological technological well, technological change. augmentation that's correct process technological right. or, or augmentation which includes communication yes let me true. just give you one one very important example of what communications have done we have a big merger and acquisition movement in corporations yeah. corporations are not only downsizing as mm -hmm. you've mentioned but corporations are also merging with each other that's right now, when they merge with each other, it doesn't mean that the amount of goods that both corporations previously produced will go down. On the contrary, it'll go up. But since most of these corporations are international corporations, increasingly, yeah. what they really can do with the new communications technology is eliminate the whole vertical organization of the corporation, country by country, centralize their functions in one place, divide the labor between one country and the other. For example, make lenses in Germany, make the camera shell in Rochester, mm -hmm. make something else in uh, Mexico, and, uh, and have one place where they do administration. Well, that is another revolution yes. uh, that in a certain sense, because ne Negro Ponte, we'll be able to talk about Nicholas and Wired Magazine and some of the texts and so on, want to talk about, they will talk about the world of bits and they'll talk about the world of atoms, atoms being uh, things, actual things that That's are actually right. put together at some point instead of just information relationships and so forth. But if, they, if they're going to put these things together, if they're going to do this manufacturing process that has to produce something, it would have had to have had some sort of a revolution in transportation itself, as well as the transfer of capital and information so forth that the cybernetic revolution has encouraged. You can't move actual objects, but the transfer, containerization, other kinds of things have brought a revolution, concomitant revolution, to move things that atoms, as Mr. Negro That's Ponte right. puts it, around with great, much greater efficiency than has been the case historically in, in qualitative new terms, do you That's think? right. 33,000 okay. longshoremen used right. to work on the Brooklyn waterfront. Right. 3,000 longshoremen work today, and on any one day on the Brooklyn uh, docks, Brooklyn and Staten Island docks, where they ship twice as much as they used to, right. they only have 1,500 people working. Right. Okay. Now, now this is and they're doing this with e economic efficiency. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and this is yeah. contained this is a result of cont containerization, yeah. which is a highly automated process. Yeah. Now the second thing after this whole process of mergers and acquisitions and globalization yeah. that is developed is that uh, there is a tendency in our political culture to believe that we need small government. At but the small, moment, yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah, small, right, government yeah, is, small government is also a function of the computerization of a lot of administrative functions. Absolutely. It yes. can be downsized government. Exactly. Yeah, right. So it's not simply a political question, it's also a technical question. Right. And even if they wanted to increase services, they could increase services with fewer and fewer people. Yeah, yeah a little subtext of what we're saying here is we've got to realize that all of these things that have been taking place uh, have been taking place within, in a general political context or a policy discussion context, which is always trying to undergird the employment after 1946 and as much as possible move toward employment, or it used to be called full employment even in 46 when they were arguing, trying to find employment because that's a national goal that we have. So these technological developments and market developments are in a certain sense going against what a lot of our policy goals were in order to bring social benefit to the society because unemployment, we all wanted to try and bring unemployment down. So a little bit at cross purposes. My contention is that there's no longer any policy that is oriented to full employment in this country. Mm, even the Employment Act of 46 is still think, our grounding policy statement. Yeah, that's our grounding policy statement, but, but bit by bit, uh, both the Gingriches and the Clintons are trying as much as they can to reverse that. Their policy uh, is not even a policy of economic growth. I believe their policy at this point is a policy of getting the government out of the way of the market, and I think it's largely a return to Smithian economics. We're back to the age of Adam Smith who believed
right. that the hidden hand of God would make everything right if only we did not intervene. There, is, there, was, a, there was a contemporary of Smith called ba Baptist Say and Say's Law, which was that if, uh, you know, the creation of uh, supply will, in the normal operation of the market, create, <coughs> create its, its demand. And if, if I may, if, if you're going to be laying off, Mr. Ruther used to have these discussions with Mr. Ford, and he would say, well, what are we going to do, Mr. Ford, now that we've got these Mr. Ru It was Wilson of GM, but that's all right. No, but there was also discussions was between Ford Ruther and, and Ford. Ford. Okay. And he was talking about early development of uh, plants, and he said, we'll bring these plants in to produce the Fords, uh, Ford automobiles, Mr. Ruther, and then what are your workers going to do? And Mr. Ruther said, well, when we have no money to buy those Fords, Mr. Ford, what are you going to do? You're going to undercut your market by not having the com consumer purchasing power that the wages made possible for a mass-produced economy. They were going to undercut their market, ultimately, and it wouldn't work. They need to have consumers with money in their pocket to buy which can be mass-produced. Do you think this globalization and that uh, autarkic or national pattern that, that could be discussed and has been part of the pattern and part of the collective bargaining argumentation and so forth, that now that they're going so actively in, in a revolutionary context internationally with the, with the movement of, of um, information, capital and so forth internationally, World Trade Organization, these sort of things, and even atoms with containerization of things, that they think that they can uh, perhaps effectively undercut the buying and the purchasing power of people within the, let's say, the United States or the developed countries, as they would be able to do, create some political angst that can be covered and so forth, but they'll be able to pick up their markets in the third world, that's China and other things, and that that's a new ballgame from the business perspective, and just let those wages go down, they're too high in the developed countries anyway, let those people go down to even third world levels, or as far as politically they'll be tolerated and let the wages of the people in the developed world go down, and we'll develop our markets in the third world. And we don't have to worry about that argument that Mr. Ruther posed to uh, Mr. Well, Ford or Mr. Wilson, Wilson uh, saying what's good for GM is good for the world. You know? Actually, I, actually I, uh, you started with one proposition. I'd like to go back a little bit, and then I'll pick up the second one. No. And that is that uh, supply will create its own demand. One, Say, of, yeah. one of Keynes's... Uh, most biting comments is that it is true, supply and demand will achieve a level of equilibrium, said Keynes, mm -hmm. but a level below full employment. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And well, so, there again, back to 46. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. And, um, and I think that was the Keynesian base of the uh, Full Employment Act of 1946. The, the second point that you make, which is... It didn't actually come out full employment. It came out employment. employment. They tried to get full yeah. employment. They, well, anyway, go ahead. Anyway, the second, the second point that you make, which is very interesting, is that it does seem to be the case that in these countries, not only the United States, but UK, Germany, and France, and Italy, there is a concerted effort to keep wages down. And it will thereby reduce consumer purchasing power. I was in China last June, uh, in Shanghai, where uh, people who do the same kind of work that I do at the universities, uh, uh, various universities in Shanghai, uh, make a top uh, income of $400 a month. Right. Now, the world car is at uh, pretty much a single price, whatever, right. whether it's Japanese-made, Swedish-made, French-made, or U.S.-made. Those people cannot afford, under any circumstances, to buy cars. There are entrepreneurs in those countries, but relatively speaking, the, Russian and, the new Russian and Chinese entrepreneurs and the number of those who are genuinely rich is not large enough to make a big, uh, the difference of say, auto workers in the old Detroit uh, automobile industry buying their own cars. This is not a large number of people. This is a small number of people that those governments are counting on to become the new uh, capitalist class that's going to bring prosperity to those countries. The people who got $5 an hour in Ford's plant were not making but $2 an hour before they went there. It was very low and it was, it was a that's process, right. though. That's, that's what right. I'm trying to say. Can you see a process where those standard living will come up and they'll be able to buy maybe not automobiles but fans and smaller I, things? I think able, that's all true. They'll be able to avoid, you know, understand the political I, consequences of what's going on in this country. It may also, it may be the case, but I think it's, a, I think those issues are really always both geographic and temporal. That mm. is, depends on the place right. and it also depends on how fast they can do it. Right. And or is that their aim? Or is well, that their conscious aim? I think that's their conscious aim in some respects. I also think they're riding for a serious fall. No. The third point right. that I was going to make, mm -hmm. in addition to mergers and acquisitions and technological change, yeah. 
is that the, uh, as the consumption patterns of Western uh, industrial nations uh, uh, break from the past, that is, uh, people can't buy cars and they can't buy houses and they can't buy washing machines and, uh, and uh, more or less expensive furniture anymore, we're gonna, we face the possibility of a crisis, an economic crisis, that's largely grounded in underconsumption. Yes. Now, it's not because the consumption is naturally lower, mm -hmm. but because there's been this enormous employer inf offensive on wages, the depression of wages, and the weakness of the unions yes. in the face of Yes, exactly. That. That's yes. the point I was trying that's to correct. say. And that the, we, uh, since PAPCO and so forth, and I mean, the, the unions are not there. No. And I mean, and, and they've got all this capital ability to, to, to so much of it's becoming, ca so that, that's a real problem. And that could lead to real angst among, because that unemployment and those lower standards of living are coming not only at the lower end of the social economic, it's coming into the middle class. Barbara Ehrenreich wrote The Fear of Falling. And yeah. it's coming even into the lower reaches of some of the upper class. Well, even. that was, that you know, was that's you know, the point. So, so. It's, it, it, it's genuine, this, gen, this genuine or generic sense of angst in the American society, which takes many nasty scapegoating forms and so forth, what might be well laid at the fact that there is this creeping displacement of people's need to participate in an economic viable way in the development of the economy, don't, that, don't you think? That's right. In this and book, it's not faced by the right. body politic or our political leaders, and there's no vision that addresses that. I, I think, Harold, the point that I would put it in a, in a, a fairly succinct phrase. Good, if you can. That is to say that I think that our political leadership, our uh, corporate leadership, and much of our population is in deep denial. Yeah. And that denial is the, it, it reflects itself in a whole variety of ways. The first way it reflects itself is the fact that we still have a very, very profound need for holding on to the job culture. Right. When somebody speaks, for example, of, about the possibility of shorter work week, or it speaks about guaranteed income, yeah. as we have spoken right. in this book of, yeah. the need for broadly distributive policies right. in the tax system, or the redistributive policies in terms of uh, some people are working too much and other people are not working enough. Uh, people say, uh, well, the p reason that blacks, for example, have a, such a high rate of unemployment, or young people have a high rate of unemployment, is that they are naturally lazy. Yeah, yeah, right, right. They have yeah. not internalized <clears throat> the moral uh, work ethic. And we absolutely must el eliminate from any th th the idea of distributing according to need. It all has to be according to your productive input to That's it correct. and that work ethic and, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. We don't say in the jobless future, we don't say that people should not participate. Mm -hmm. We say people should participate, but more and more of it has to be what we call non-market or decommodified kind of participation. Amen. Like public access television. For example. One big generic uh, place right. where a lot of that, or theater and arts and some of the, in fact, some of the things that are the greatest flowering of the human spirit might well be done within a non-moneyed oriented relationship. Love, and can't buy me love, Beatles used to say. I mean, without being Pollyanna-ish or anything like that, but there might be more of that kind of activity in terms of a well-organized society. I wonder if I could bring up one other thing is that if you look at that, and you know, you understand, I've sent you some literature, we've had some exchange. I always have liked this fellow, Lewis Kelso, and the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership right. Plans, where they began to spread some ownership to the workers within the ESOPs. Um, if you look at a chart and you look at the input of labor on the one side and you put technology or capital on the other side, the input of capital has risen greatly through time relative to what it was in Tom Jefferson's time. You know, hammer to build some shoes and things. Right. But now capital is very important in capital, and the capital is very narrowly held by relatively few people. Fewer and fewer all the fewer time. Fewer and fewer, I think, Mr. Peter Drucker notwithstanding with his notions of, uh, people's you know, capitalism. people's capitalism and people's, uh, so, you know, pension socialism and so forth. But this idea, is there anything to be said for the idea that as capital itself becomes more responsible for the production not talking about productivity, but talking about production, that the ownership of the robot, let's say, could be more widely diffused among the general society as a way of building market ability and distributing of income by something other than the labor input to the productive process in the mass-produced economy, and perhaps then free people up with income to be able to be participant in that part of the economy that is not money-oriented and where the, human, the real human spirit 
flowers. If you can understand what I I'm saying. I can understand saying, what you're saying. Is there anything to be said yes, for that I at think, all? I think ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans. And binary economics. And binary economics. The ESOP is just the tip of the right, iceberg of, yeah. Of binary. These are valuable tools, valuable weapons, actually, for preserving people's dignity. Uh, why do we need to shut down the National Steel Plant in West Virginia when the workers, as they did, could, in fact, purchase the plant? Weirton. Weirton, yes. Yeah, right. Uh, the Weirton Steel. Excuse, yeah. uh, National Steel, too. Uh, the, yeah, right, right, right. And yeah. um, why should a, a big knitting factory in Amsterdam, New York, go down when people could actually have these employee stock ownership programs? Uh, that, uh, a cooperative arrangement whereby workers hold on to their jobs, even if they have to take uh, some reductions of pay at beginning and in order to reinvest, because mm. in most of these plans, the employers simply did what landlords have done in New York City housing. They, uh, they milked it for all it was worth, and then they split. Well, uh, been, in many cases. In, in many cases. The idea has been, in a sense, ripped off. That's by right. People, I understand. But the idea of the kernel of the idea. It's pretty good. The, um, that's one thing. And then, of course, people could be working. Uh, other people with income could be doing uh, a lot of decommodified things. I think, I think that um, the idea of sharing uh, ownership is important. Let me make one point. I went to uh, a conference near Stockholm yeah. not three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. In that conference, somebody brought up a very old Swedish plan mm. which had been scrapped, and that was to use union pension funds to buy out Swedish capitalism. Uh -huh. It would yeah. not eliminate the market economy, it would not eliminate many features of capitalism, but capital which in Sweden now is holding the welfare state ransom for lower wages and lower uh, benefits okay. uh, could be bought, off, bought out by uh, pension plans. I belong to the Teachers Insurance Annuity Association, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which holds my pension, which has uh, uh, assets of 47 to 50 billion dollars. Right, 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 right. Larger right. than the big three. Right, right. And th they invest in the economy as it is. Yeah. They have no strategy for addressing the economic problems of the society as a whole. Right. If pension plans like the Teamsters and the Teachers and a variety of other pension plans were deployed, I'm using the military metaphor because that's what they'd have to be, right. to actually develop a new regime of production, a new regime of leisure, a new regime of ownership, uh -huh. we could have a very different kind of and a much more human, spiritually satisfying society. It makes sense, doesn't it, for to have the labor take the van and that, because after all, they're going to be affected by it. And they've not been able, as you say, as we say, they, 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 in the recent experience, they've not been able to stand up to the market forces have been directed against them, the labor immune, sad to say. They've not, because some of these issues have been collectively bargainable, and they haven't been able to arrive at something um, that, you know, it was maybe because uh, th 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 they were not able, they, they, they had such a stake in having the labor value of the labor. We have a, a, a Europe, you've had, you've studied Marxist theory, the surplus value labor, or yeah. surplus labor theory, that is the value of the labor is what is it productive, and capital is stolen, or it's congealed labor, or they've got these traditional views so that they don't want to be associated with filthy lucre or something like that or something, or, something, right. or something and there's that and there's that idea always of having free human beings rather than people who are tied up in that kind of thing has that been for people on the progressive side of things i think everybody's a af time? everybody's afraid see we have this we have this idea in our head harold yeah i mean the 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 left has this idea and it's by which i mean uh, not only the, the the progressives the, the the labor people and so on yeah. and the idea has been we have to stay away from this um from business. Yeah. We have to have an antagonistic uh, other side of the table relationship. Well, in many cases that makes sense, yeah. but increasingly it doesn't make sense to not use our resources to make the fight for jobs and make the fight for income and make the fight for a decent life. Uh, there are very few, there have been some individual unions and some individual groups of workers who've seen that they either will invest their resources or else they're going to be out of business, but very few. One of the things that's happened is that these huge pension funds that unions negotiate with employers across the bargaining table 
have been given to Wall Street investment bankers mm -hmm, to deal with. Mm -hmm. They are run and managed by by uh, by brokers, by investment well, bankers, they by lawyers. Somewhere. It's got to be invested That's somewhere. They can put it in treasury bills or something. But ERISA tries to guarantee the legitimacy of that. There's been some questions about that huge, you know, the the strength. We did have a savings and loan problem, didn't we? Yes, you know? we did. And there are others that we have in mind. So. So there is that, there is that, but there's that question of whether or not, and you said it, you said we, that they can bargain for jobs and income. Now, is it possible to be arguing for ownership as a source of income for the mass, rather than 95% of the people in our population would probably think only of getting income for life's purposes by having what you call a job or by transfer payments. I mean, that's the way they think. And yet the technology is increasingly in automated processes, as your book points out, is what's really responsible for the production, right? That's right. So if they own a robot, does somebody who own a robot have a legitimate claim to have income coming to them? And if it's good for the 5% who own it all, or 1% own 43% of the capital <coughs> assets now, if it's good for them, would it be good for all to democratize that as a way of having income that would then free them with that income to do what they wanted in non-commoditized kinds of activities. And could we try to move toward that kind? Or is that violating some sort of economic principle that would not work? Or oh, work? I think it worked perfectly well. I don't think it's an economic principle at all. Uh -huh. I think it's a principle of power. Uh -huh. For example, okay. if, if, but if we don't address that. I understand not, that. The, the progressive forces don't address that. If, if we T leave the ground to them. If a TIAA simply used 1% of its assets, and that's a lot, uh, to invest in a particular industry, communications or um, uh, automobiles or whatever it wanted to do, it could have pretty rapidly a controlling interest. Yeah. It would have to make certain kinds of alliances with other groups of capital. It might even have to develop a program uh, for takeovers in one case and not takeover in another case. But it would be able to make certain kinds of demands on corporations as well as on um, banking organizations and investment organizations, which today it hasn't got any power to do. Seymour Mel Melman's come on to that now and seen the importance of it. And he said, if you can get the people on the board, if you get the pass-through rights of employee stock ownership plans, they could be on the board. They could have a say on that. And that's a, uh, you know, that's an important, that's an important issue. I, I guess I'm just thinking, well, how far does this process of mass-produced things being done. I know they have factories that are operated with virtually, uh, your colleague Rifkin has written another book you're mm -hmm. familiar with, you know, The End of Work. He said it's a virtually workless world. They've got product processing, manufacturing process of high quality goods that are virtually, there's no worker at all. <coughs> well, Sarah Lee. Uh, Sarah Lee is. Sarah Lee is it is, but I understand. Example, right? Right, yes. right. They, they said no human hands ever touch Sarah Lee. Yeah, but nobody right. ever, and nobody ever doesn't like Sarah Lee. Right. Now, of course, right. increasingly, with robotization and um, numerical controls and other com computer processes, there are very few people producing a lot of different goods. For example, the electric light is produced by seven people in one plant in Cleveland, Amazing. Ohio. Amazing. Amazing. Phillips right. has practically, t and GE, have taken over the world's electric light right. industry. And they're making... Small numbers of people. Exactly right. And they're making these things that are really good. They're making these things that people have a legitimate right to want. And on a world scale, the material mass-produced things, uh, they, 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 they have a perfect right to expect these things. And with as Bucky Fuller, our, uh, my, I think uh, he used to say ephemeralization or being able to do more with less, <coughs> you might be able to produce more uh, in, a, in an almost a post-scarcity kind of view that he has, more uh, without raping the planet. It, the ecological safeguards need be there and the, the microprocessors helping well, and other things it might be. But they've got, the people have a right to have an increased standard of living. We can't just let the people of the world not have a material standard of living, and they have a, one of those is that some sort of a way, but we're in a collision course with the way we distribute income and the way we produce goods. Look at the, uh, the last... And service. The last six months is characterized, among other things, by a Republican Congress mm. uh, with the support of the President. Absolutely. He's uh, way over on the Reducing right. the uh, uh, pollution standards, the water standards, the various ecological standards on the grounds that economic growth um, uh, will be impeded if we continue these regulations. Uh, we have a situation where 
last week the under the assistant secretary of labor for occupational safety and health uh, said that they will not issue a new standard for ergonomic uh, uh, sitting in front of computers for the whole computer process because business interests have opposed it. Uh -huh, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. So that we do have real issues in terms of all these, all these questions of economic as well as political battles around jobs as to whether we're going to have an ecological society. Right. Yeah. Um, it's important. And they're yeah. political issues. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we raise at the end of this book the question against many progressives who will say uh, economic growth is the first priority. No, we say that can't be the first priority. Human survival and human life has got to be the first priority. Amen. Right. Well, but that means that we have to find ways of uh, addressing the water problem, the garbage problem, sure. the problem of pollution, the problem mm. of ergonomics, in ways that will at the same time guarantee people a decent standard of life. Right. It's not going to be simple. Increasing numbers of people on a world scale. That's right. It is not simple. It's not simple. Because if you go to Eastern Europe where until 1989 or 90, they had, let's face it, not a wonderful standard of life, but compared to what many of those countries have now, yeah. they were doing better. Those places were ecological disasters. Yeah, all right, right. Ecological disasters. Right. They made a decision that they could not have industrialization and uh -huh. ecology uh -huh. at the same time. As to Buckminster Fuller's prediction that with these new post-scarcity types of industrial processes, we could make a much more ecological society. That's true and not true. It is true that it's compared to the old industrial technologies of steel and of um, um, uh, uh, electricity and so on. These were, the, what we have now is much, much cleaner. The satanic mills. Yeah, the Blake, satanic yeah. mills of yeah. Blake, right. Yeah. Um, but it's all, the, but there are new problems. I mean, one of the things that you saw on the New York Times um, on, uh, in June, in early June, was a big story in which uh, in the Science Times for, um, for uh, Tuesday the 13th of, Ju of June mm -hmm. was that um, scientists are now doubting that the electromagnetic fields produced by alternate currents uh, are, are injurious to human uh, health. That yeah. is, they, they're, yeah, not cancer, that, yeah. they're not cancer producing. Yeah. I think the jury's still out on those kinds of issues. Right. Thomas Edison in the early part of the century War, late part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century, wanted to do direct current and not alternate, alternate current, arguing that the, electron, uh, the electromagnetic fields, fields would make people sick. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much convinced that that's the case. I think there's a lot of people who are still convinced that that's the case. Uh, the scientific evidence that it doesn't have any uh, injurious effects reminds me of those people who still said, well, it, uh, the ultimate cause of cancer is genetic and mm. it's not p environmental. Yeah, I mean, right, right. it's the same kind of argument. Yeah, these things need, yeah. They right. need to be worked through, but right, right. we're not spending the money for the research right. necessary to settle those right. questions. Uh -huh. I would make as a hypothesis that even with the new technologies, we'd have to worry about things like radiation from computer screens, electromagnetic fields from increasing use of communications technologies, okay. and a variety of other th of those issues. I think they could be solved. I don't think we need alternate current. I think we could use a lot of direct current, except for certain kinds of global communications. Well, we don't need as much alternate current as we're using. The, the generic question, or the systems thinking, and again, systems, comprehensive yeah. thinking, is whether or not there is anything to this, to this idea of that we will, through elegance of design, and design has been pretty grim throughout history. The internal combustion engine, 20 years, is very, very bad design through elegance of design, new materials, and through, in general, ephemeralization of being able to do more with less. One example we have that has come upon us is the, it took a room of vacuum tubes the size of this room, what is now on one tiny little Intel That's chip. That's right. And it's going down just incredibly. Min 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 so ephemeralization more, leads to an yes, ephemeralization. Ephemeralization, yes, you do it more so that you can have without raping. It's not a serial sum thing where for some to have, others cannot. So that's an important philosophical point that could be discussed. And it also introduces me to where I want to talk to you about one other group of the so-called optimists uh, are uh, Negroponte and the people who read Wired Magazine and Stuart Brand and all of the people who say SciTech and the new cyberspace 
the Steersman Society into which we're coming is going to take care. They seem to be very optimistic because they're going to have a lot of desktop publish or whatever. What do you say to the people who think that everything's going to be taken care of? Isn't it? I don't want to put a, you know, too, 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 too glib a thing on it, but the people who generally are, are the cyber space people who think that things are generally well, the Wired magazine people and the people who think succinctly. these problems are going to work. Sink, succinctly. Yes. I would say to them, I believe that there are great wonders in technology that we can count on. I believe that there will be, uh, for many people, more play, more play, more interesting play, more kinds of pleasure, even virtual reality is a, is a possibility in that respect. Let's ask the question first. How will this new technology impact on people's livelihoods? Let's ask that first. You get at the economics a little. Yeah, right. Just, just, just. Yeah. And when you, when you confront people with that and you say, but services are themselves being technologically uh, revolutionized, that in fact you can't, you went from agriculture to industrial to service, but now all of the above are automated. All of the above have labor-saving technologies. Mr. Toffler notwithstanding. Notwithstanding, Mr. Toffler, then what we need and Mrs. Is, is a social hmm. program, a social approach to making sure that people don't get hurt. Right. And I don't mean get hurt temporarily, yeah, but I, I mean get a turn in the long run. Yes, when systems, we have, yeah. When we have created a system of, of, uh, of, 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 of guaranteed income of non-commodified work without the kind of labor that people kill. Non-commodified work. work, guaranteed income. How are we going to guarantee income? We can guarantee income by having, a, by having the people who actually benefit most from these wondrous technologies share some of the benefits. We had the ad hoc committee in the Triple Revolution, Robert Theobald and these folks right. back in the 60s and everything. Did we learn lessons from them? Have we learned lessons? No. Because if you ask we me, I don't learned. see the vision yet. We still haven't learned the, the new lesson. paradigm that's going to make it possible for us, you know. And I, that's what I, I come back again to that idea that we, we ought to be investigating some way of allowing the, the, the logic of business finance. You, you make an investment, it pays for itself, and the people who own that get income from it. And it can't be tied only to past savings. Charles de Gaulle said it'll lock us in forever to, um, to an internal class struggle. And Harold Moulton saw that in 1935. We've got to somehow allow the future earnings capacity of what we're able to invest in be able to be part of the basis by which we can make investments in the name of democratizing the ownership of the capital because the capital is becoming concentrated in so few hands. It, it is and in, they can't already buy. They it buy. Is in, it is in the fact, it's going to undercut the market. In fact, it's socialized. And nobody will face that. And because of what it's socialized, I, what I, mean is, I mean is that there's there's no real individual ownership of any of these things. Mm -hmm. When people invoke the old small town vision of the entrepreneur uh, in, uh, in uh, Orson Welles' film, The Magnificent Ambersons, yes. you see Joseph Cotton inventing yeah. a new automobile. Right, right, right. That is a very old, old, old image. Right. These are corporate inventors. You think that's part of the cyberspace uh, Yes, of thinking? course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They want to go back to the turn of the century, they envisioned themselves as new Wright brothers, new Henry Fords, new Marconis, and I don't think that's... I and think that all those things will find a market niche somewhere. That's somewhere. Yes, it will find a market niche all right. somewhere. Well, is but that maybe the secret? Is that going to lead us out of here? We have people in this I know. world. All right, that's And fine. the fact is, our borders can't be permanently closed down. Right, right. Uh, from the people who are still going to be significantly have-nots around the world, right. we have to find a global solution. Right. And the global solution has to be in some, when I use the word socialized, I mean this, these corporations, if uh, Drucker is half right, are not owned by the person who controls it because he has two, three percent of the gross assets. Uh, it's it's owned by it's widely widely owned. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with that three percent person. That three percent person controls because he's got organization. He's yeah. got networks. But I mean, even even at the level of the ownership. I mean, even at the level of the ownership of the ownership as a as a means of distributing income. Yeah, is something that seems not to have been faced in a serious way. A viable holding of but capital. That's a re but that's a redistributive. Uh, well, it, it, it's redistributive, but it's re it, but it's also the building. It's not redistributive where you tax those who have in order to distribute according to need in a in a in a in a traditional you know d d transfer payment kind of way. 
it is it isn't taxing those who have to do it. Well, I don't see so why it's that not tax and spend. It is it and it Harold, is not under kidding. I got I got to stop you. Okay. A woman, and I'm speaking primarily of women, is at home. Right. And she raises children. Right. She makes sure they're clean and they they eat, they're eating and that they're safe and they don't get killed by a car. This woman's children grow up and go to work for General Electric or right. go to work for um, uh, uh, in, any Microsoft, Intel, uh, Intel, Intel anything, yeah. anybody. Yeah. Is that woman getting a transfer payment if you give her income? She's actually producing the labor that makes possible the, w the running of our society. Ultimately, if you can draw that out, you can but, see that. Well, but I mean, that's, yeah. that is another approach to the kind of uh, foolishness about transfer payments. These are not people who are doing nothing. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, the person who gets Social Security spent 50 years of their lives working. Mm -hmm. And that's why they can't touch Social Security. But we've not made the same argument for people who are homemakers. We've not made the same argument for people who No, but we could. No, what I'm we trying to make no, the we're, we're in complete agreement, except it's just a different way of how do you get to it in a certain sense. Is that whether that be done, um, you know, it seems to me that there could be that homemaker or the aid dependent children mother or somebody of that sort. Rather than, you know, there could be a, a, an ownership stake being done. I mean, we could create a production act rather than a full product. A full, per, uh, a full employment act, we could produce a full production act that's going to allow us to do what we're technologically capable of doing. And build, rather than have the ownership be in this small elite group at the top, have it be disseminated widely among sure. everybody as a way of having income distributed to them. And we don't ever seem to address that. All we do is we say, if we can't give her the money, they would tell her to go out and get a non-existent job in that wealth and called welfare reform. And we have a problem. Somehow we have to have some sort of a way yeah, of she, linking people to the way but, things are actually but produced. But suppose she actually, but suppose she actually owned, suppose she actually owned a, a small, viable holding, a small day, a daycare facility to allow other people to go to work in offices and factories. But she took care of their children. That is a stake. Instead of saying to this person, "Go rake leaves," yeah, take some work. kind of a job, right. make work. Th there can be. Productive labor, w productive work, which is related to what she does anyway. Well, okay, yeah. I mean, there's a hundred different things. Ultimately, and in the systems way, it's the technology is misplacing people, and that taking care of those children might be one of those things that will take place within the non-commoditized yeah, world. Because she's got a real income. social, yeah. re because she has the income. That's right. To be in a certain sense independently able to do what it is. She and her fellow friends and other people, they might want to do jazz, they might want to make art, they might want to have sure. a, build a society, but they've got to have some way of having income other than only a job as a way of having income. We better learn how submit. to live our lives by making art. We better learn how to make exactly. our life uh, lives by by doing uh, things other than watching television and going to work for right. wages and because we're not going to have the option. That's right. And, that's right. And, and the problem is nobody at this point is addressing what do we do with free time. Nobody's got, yeah. And how do we make sure that the people that pe have the free time also have the wherewithal to be able to live a good that's and right. decent standard of living? And there are very few people, practically no one addressing it. One who is addressing it is Stanley Aronowitz thank you. with a groundbreaking research. Would you like to thank you very very much for the book? And let me show you right at the very end. We've only just begun to scratch the surface, obviously, but let's let them see the book again. Uh, it's a University of Minnesota Press, That's right? correct. And it's called The Jobless Future, and subtitle is? SciTech and the Dogma of Work. Dogma of Work. Dogma of Work We've got to look at that work ethic or that job ethic. Our bite mock fry was over the house, well, which you yeah. have to be careful about overusing this idea of, uh, you know, jobs as a way of keeping people right. under control and so forth. And we want to have some freedom. That's it. Stanley, once again, thank you very much thank for you. coming in. We thank you for viewing. We'll see you next time. Uh, Stanley Aronowitz, CUNY, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.